Hi everyone, I'm Hesse Jones and tonight we have the Gen X Think Tank. We have actually an interesting uh, topic that we're discussing tonight called the collaborative economy. And uh, we have some great panelists with us today. And uh, Jason Konopinski is going to lead the discussion today. But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to provide an intro. And then after that, we're going to introduce our guests. And then we'll get right into it. OK. So about five years ago, I actually started, I, I was watching TEDx. And uh, there was this woman named Rachel Botsworth that introduced this notion of collaborative consumption. And she talked about this powerful cultural and economic force that's changing the way we consume and behave. Um, this idea of the internet that's instigating this ability to actually match uh, haves with have-nots and to be able to swap to things with strangers. Um, she coined this phrase, the coincidence of wants. And so I actually read a stat that uh, from last year that talked about how strong this collaborative economy is. And they said that in 2013, the revenue flowing uh, through the shared economy directly into people's wallets uh, had surpassed almost 3.5 billion in that same year. And it actually grew 25% from the year before. At that rate, they talked about the idea of peer-to-peer uh, -peer sharing, that that was going to be a lot more than just an income boost, especially in, in an economy where uh, there's been stagnant wages. And it's now being a really, really disruptive economic force. So um, why did this idea come about? Like, th there's four main factors. They talk about this renewed importance in, in, this, uh, in the idea of community, where people are starting to trust each other more than they're trusting corporations. Uh, obviously, technology has a lot to do with it, the peer-to-peer the, the -peer networks that are, that are changing the way people consume and share information. There's this thing, and I, I'm not sure if it, it came out of our generation, but also um, it's been catalyzed by a lot of the millennials as well, is this, these unresolved environmental concerns where we started with our concern for reducing waste and recycling. Um, but what we also wanted to do, what we also um, are doing as, as a result of the collaborative economy is tapping into this um, the value of these underutilized resources and the, these idling effects um, within the economy, and that's where you know the the growth of let's say Airbnb and and Uber has come about. So, and the uh, the biggest shift right now is the global recession, and is changing the way that that uh, people are behaving because people are now living a little bit more pragmatically because they realize that, that there is not, not going to be any kind of economic stability. So when we talk about sharing, sharing is to ownership like the iPhone is to a CD. I don't want the CD, I want the music that it carries. I want the experience, I don't want the product. So from, from this perspective, usage actually trumps possessions. And th these, this is one of the things that I, I want to talk about here is whether or not you know, are we are we really adapting to it? Are we are we um, embracing this whole notion? Okay. So with that, I'm going to give it to uh, Jason, and then he can he can have the floor. He can he can introduce the panel in the meantime. Excellent. Yeah, I'm 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 happy to moderate this uh, the, this most recent iteration of the the Gen X Think Tank, and this is actually a topic that I'm 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 pretty um, excited about because I think it offers us a lot of opportunities to do some different things. Um, I'm I'm I think we're um, as we open it, I think we can be in some ways are are less less concerned from a strictly generational perspective on on um, the rise of the collaborative economy and the rise of the sharing economy. And I think there's really, there's an opportunity here to talk um, kind of global impact and, and how, what it's done um, economically, what it's done socially, what it's done um, at, a, at a community level too. So with that, um, just uh, we can run through the panel and, and everybody introduce themselves. Um, and I think the best way to, to do this is do you, you have you used a um, a, a sharing service or a, a um, like a ride share or using something that we would consider it to be on, as part of the collaborative economy? So, Brian, take it away. Uh, all right, I'm Brian Carter. Uh, I've written several books. Um, do a lot with digital marketing and Facebook, and then also wrote one of the Cowbell Principle recently. Um, you know, I think if I understand this correctly. And and so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way that 
we as Gen X kind of started blogging and sharing information that was free as opposed to just only being in books or paid magazines. Um, Kickstarter, um, crowdsourcing, all those, I think those things fit in this too. Is that mm -hmm. your guys' understanding? Yeah, yeah I think yeah, I, so, I can, we can certainly go further than that. So that's huge because for me, um, you know, I would not have been able to teach myself the digital marketing stuff I, I have taught myself if those blogs weren't out there, right? And and so I think that's a collaborative, like, investigation. It takes everything, like, that would be normally researched or whatever and makes it um, – it's something that happens for free and individual people and businesses are doing their own research and sharing it, you know? Um, I've, I've seen that happen a lot more in, in like, the SEO realm and the pay-per-click than in – social media, but um, but that's been super valuable for me. And I, I funded one of my books with Kickstarter. Um, and crowdsourcing, I mean, I've done, I don't know if interviews fall under that, people interviewing each other and podcasting for free. That's a way of, it's all like this free information flow, which is super valuable and empowers people. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think we're moving over to Doug. Hitting on mute. Hey, I'm uh, Doug Haslam, and just in my history. Well, first of all, Jason, thanks for uh, leading this. I, I don't know who was born between 1964 and 1982 and left you king, but uh, there we go. It's a little Gen X humor, right? Um, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, I, I just you know as a as a um, kind of a background, I I started out in broadcast, which apparently still exists. Went into PR, which apparently still exists went into social media, which I think we still tolerate, and now my work is more in, um, I mean, it's in content marketing, but also mm -hmm. SEO, which is cooler than it used to be. Um, so things kind of come around and change and come back and, 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 and are the same, but in terms of, I, I struggled with the Gen X label, because when I first heard it, I didn't want to have a label, and I didn't know if I identified with everybody, and like some other folks have already talked about in our kind of preamble, um, there are some, I think, Gen Y characteristics to how we consume media and how we do things, but there's also, you know, our our uh, generational um, outlook. And, and in terms of what we use, I think my, my biggest journey has been through music, because I like music. I like to own my own collection. And there was nothing about streaming services and subscriptions that really attracted me um, until there was a bridge built by, I think, Spotify, and what Spotify did and what kind of got me over that bridge was they let me take, okay, you can take the music you own and put it in your Spotify collection. It's like, okay, that's great. And then I can build on it with a subscription service. So it's kind of a hybrid thing that that uh, that uh, kind of, you know, carried me over the bridge um, for that. And I, I, think, I think different media and different products um, have a different – weight in terms of whether we want to own them or share them, but uh, that's that's one example I think that a lot of people have on their minds. Hmm. Thanks, Doug. Mila? Hi, um, I'm Mila. Um, I am a director at a financial services firm, but I'm also the producer of 140 Conference Montreal. And this subject is really interesting to me because I see it um, touching us in all kinds of areas, um, especially more and more as the years go by. The first time I used um, something that I would that would now be similar to Airbnb was probably about 20, 19, 20 years ago, where you had to kind of write in and become part of this home exchange program and become a member and you'd get like a catalog and you would like write by mail to people in Europe or wherever and, and arrange your exchange. So I just find it amazing how far we've come with our technology to be able to, to have this accessible to everyone. Back then it was like this crazy thing that I was doing that, you know, obviously there were people around the world doing it. So that was my first kind of um, collaborative economy experience. Um, but it was old school, really old school. <laughs> um, as, and then um, one of the things that I, I find is really um, great now is that this has expanded not just to travel, to make travel accessible to people, but, you know, it's straight down to things like Craigslist where, you know, you have the very basic things in your home that could be junk to you. You can sell it. Some people give it away. 
but I love this idea of sharing um, that's happening not only with intelligence and, and information but with actual physical goods so I think it's just a wonderful situation uh, and, and place that we're going to I want to um, can I just put a stat out because I remember when before eBay came out and this was a stat that came out I think two years ago and they said let me see here that at there are 130 million people, uh, sorry, people that bought and sold goods from eBay last year. Um, at any given moment in time, there are at least half a billion products for sale, the majority of which are secondary goods. And that's that was an important thing that uh, Mila had talked about, is this idea of um, sustainability and, and the fact that people want stuff that other people have, I guess, gently used or pre-owned. So and that's that's an important part of the the sharing economy. Whether or not it, it it's a car, it's your home, it's old um, eight track tapes or whatever. There's always somebody that wants it. So I'll I'll withhold my comment until we get through the introductions. But I want to come back to that one, Hesse. Okay. Um, so Stevie, take us away. Oh, you're muted. Did that work? Yeah, now yes. you're yeah. Cool. Uh, I, my name is Stevie Duran. Uh, I apologize for being late. <laughs> um, I am an entrepreneur, and I'm actually in the service industry in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I am probably the least tech savvy of anybody on this panel. So uh, it'll be interesting to learn from all of you guys. Um, I was telling Hesse not too long ago that I actually even only learned about Uber in November. So in Wyoming, I, I, I feel like we are kind of insulated from a lot of the um, a lot of the more techie stuff, or at least myself, I haven't had to uh, be super tech savvy. But um, I think that speaking to the coming together in a more group type mentality, um, I think I definitely see it even here in our community as well as kind of on the whole, and I think it's where our kind of collective consciousness is moving, which is a really awesome concept. Um, so I think it's very interesting times in which we live, and it'll be cool. fascinating to see where this goes. Excellent. So I yeah. wanted to, um, to to come back to, um, to respond, actually, to, to Hesse's comment. Uh, significant that the, the volume of, of goods uh, that are sold on eBay, but I question the definition in really calling it a um, calling it part of the collaborative economy. I mean, all like eBay has just created the framework that people can buy and sell goods. You know, right. so that where where I were, and this may be a, a, a distinction that we can kind of tease out, but for me, the collaborative economy is you know sharing those experiences. Just building a framework where other people can sell their stuff doesn't necessarily make it collaborative. If we wanted to take, if we wanted to define it as um, the the exchange of goods and services in a in a shared way, then I think a better example um, would be something like FreeCycle. You know, it's a it's a service that I had used um, over the years. Um, I've got an old couch and I don't want to take it to the dump, so hey, it's here, come pick it up. Um, and and that works within kind of these like these small niche communities within um, l geographic areas to say okay if I need gardening equipment if I need um, seeds if I need um, if I'm getting rid of furniture just for like a, a you know I'm I'm updating that that rather than getting it to a dump and and or taking it to a, a landfill um, there's an opportunity for somebody to grab it there so I think that might be a better example of it in action than, than something like eBay. It depends. I, I guess the only the, the thing I would say is that um, platforms like eBay, and if you think about it, um, Airbnb is the same kind of thing because it, it's not necessarily sharing. People are actually using their own homes to be able to rent, but they're 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 doing it in ways that that give um, the broader market an opportunity to to look at options. For places mm -hmm. to stay as opposed to a hotel. What eBay has allowed is that you can sell anything and it could be new mm -hmm. or used but it gives everybody an option to 
to get stuff that they need without having to pay full price at, at let's say, a corporate um, let's say environment like say an Apple mm -hmm. or whatever so it from, from that perspective it's not like retail in the true sense of the word that's controlled by the corporations it's it's actually peer-to-peer -peer type distribution so okay okay that's just I'll my marketing definition yeah I can concede that I, I think it's you know I, I'm getting hung up on the, the, the idea of it being collaborative in a, in, a, in a real way I think you know peer-to-peer -peer, you know person-to-person -person sales that's that makes sense, um, yeah. but in, in terms of it really being collaborative and, and a shared experience, I, that's where I'm. I'm well, let, let's open down. it up. I want to see what, what do you guys think. What do you guys think, Doug? Um, well, just eBay was an interesting thing to bring up because that was um, you know an older. Um, I was a bigger eBay user probably around 1999, 2000, and unloading my my vinyl record collection, and what was. Interesting Which to me. You may that. have bought some of those records. <laughs> you may have. How much did you pay? Um, well, what was interesting about that whole experience, um, especially the early eBay, was it was kind of the flea market of the internet. That um, Craigslist kind of took that sort of mind share. Sorry, buzzword drink. But um, <laughs> but the the the, the it, depending on how you're defining collaborative, there there is some one element of it that I think is a lot of it is uh, creating efficiencies and mm -hmm. reusing things or using things that aren't vital. And one of those is you know unloading secondhand goods and eBay was king of that. And the other thing about eBay was that it was it was really a community. I mean you relied on the feedback and the back and forth from the between the buyers okay. and sellers and that was a huge thing. eBay eventually became more of a stores selling their stuff and it became a bit more corporate in ways that a lot of mature technologies and companies do. And I suppose as we go along, we look at some of the younger companies, we'll probably see the same thing. But um, I think I think it does belong in that category, or at least the original idea of eBay and mm -hmm. how it how it worked more before. Yeah, I, I saw what uh, Brian had put in chat under Wikipedia. Was this mm -hmm. Brian? When this, uh, from your perspective, when this was actually put up, was that was that the the I would say one of the original definitions of what this is collaborative consumption, but that that falls under the same premise of. of yeah, I just googled collaborative economy and got sharing economy, which is um, in Wikipedia says sometimes referred to as a peer-to-peer -peer mesh or collaborative economy, also collaborative consumption. Um, so that's that's why I was kind of exploring what are these different things. When you first brought up the topic, I thought, oh, it's when we work on stuff together, you know, or whatever. So I didn't know there was a technical um, meaning to it. It's pretty complex, actually. I mean, mm. there's a ton of reading here for this, so we're going <laughs> to like, do as well as we can. With, well, uh, uh, and, but to, to Jason's point as well is that there – you know the collaborative economy. The, it was from from the definition. It's pure sharing and pure like finding the wants and the for, between the haves mm -hmm. and have nots. But then now it's moved to to actually now creating a, a, an e economic booster for individuals, where they can actually take stuff that they own and use it as a way to actually make money, right? So mm -hmm. maybe we could take a look at the two definitions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I wonder if it's it's like moving from the, just a pure capitalistic thing where you have to buy absolutely everything, including information, personally, to some things being free. I mean, I think the whole freemium thing comes into play here mm -hmm. as well. And it's like Hulu is somewhat free, right? But they also have a capitalistic model. Mm -hmm. Well, so maybe um, a, a good like to really come in and, and go in swinging here, I think a good place to maybe start is does a collaborative economy exist in practice? You know, or is it really, like, are we really just talking about capitalism under another name? Um, and, that, and, and framing that, you know, from the perspective of um, the, the conversation that has happened around Uber... You know that they, in some ways, that they are um, they're mono they're they're taking advantage of this idea of what the collaborative economy is or is in 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 uh, philosophically, and they're just reducing costs. Yeah. Um. 
I, mean, I feel like Uber has become less of a collaborative thing to me and and more of a disruptor to a in what is in many cities a corrupt taxi cab industry mm -hmm. and uh, and it, it is collaborative in that people I know for Lyft this is true and I assume for Uber that people are using their own cars and mm -hmm. and uh, kind of making uh, making available you know basically excess um, inventory of basically driving time. Um, at least that's part of it, but but I think there's there's more to it that kind of gets out of the whole collaborative economy yeah, thing. I mean, I've taken well, like those town cars where the guy that was driving me owned his own car too, you know. So it's it's all, it does seem like it's more like just well, here's more options at different prices, or here's a different sort of service. I don't know mm -hmm. that Uber necessarily would qualify as this sharing type of thing. Uh, you know, those like where you can the deals where you can use the car for a while. I'm not in a city that does that, you know, but the, um, what do like, they call those? Well, so like, so Zipcar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and even then, you know, like I, I, I question the idea of Zipcar being a really good example there too, because Zipcar owns their fleet. Yeah. They you do. know, it's, so it's, it, so it, it is, a, it's approaching it from a different way. Zipcar owns the fleet where it, it becomes part of a, a sharing economy is, giving somebody access to a car for a couple of hours. Right. And so what, then as a consumer, it says, okay, I don't need a car because I live in a geographic area um, in an urban center where I don't need one, but here is a service that's available to me for those times where, like, I need to go to the grocery store or I need to go to Lowe's that's across town. Right. And taking, taking Metro or a bus is just not going to, like, I've got too much stuff. I really need a car for those, for those circumstances. Yeah, it's a different. It is a different model. One thing I'm, I think, though, when when we talk about the different um, variables that define collaborative economy, it's also this idea idea of sustainability, and mm -hmm. they talk about this in, in a lot of uh, gen, sorry millennials in in our last uh, talk about the collaborative economy actually embrace this idea of Uber um, as well as Lyft because. A lot of them do live in the cities, and also there, there's this, they, they just can't afford a vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea of actually owning um, something right now is just not feasible. Um, and, and also from a sustainability perspective, um, what, what did they say about, uh, the, the person who started Zipcar said, most cars stay idle for, what, 23 hours a day on average, mm -hmm. and, the, and the cost to actually maintain a vehicle is about seven hundred and something dollars a month. And so, if people, so there's an incredible waste that's happening, which it, which actually gave rise to this idea of Zipcar. So mm -hmm. Uber is different because the the thing is, is now anybody can become kind of like their own cabbie from an Uber perspective. But I think from a capitalistic perspective, we have to ask ourselves. Where's all the money going? Like because everybody talks about whether or not there's a, a wage inequity when it comes to Uber, or whether or not a, a bunch of it is actually going into the pockets of of the technology itself. Kind of worries me, like as a capitalist, the idea of becoming so efficient that our cars are never wasting any time sitting around. Because I know the car companies bank on that, right? I mean, if they could only sell a tenth as many cars, how many of them would go out of business and how many people wouldn't have jobs? So I wonder if, like, waste is required for capitalism, <laughs> you know? That's an interesting question. Um, now, I want to ask um, Stevie. Now, did you actually use an Uber service when you when you first heard about it? Like, where you are, is it is? are there a lot of people using Uber? We don't have Uber where I live, so okay. I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. I've never used it. I have no experience with it. Okay, so so it's not so you have your own car then. It's not it's it's not necessarily an option, not an option, but a, a need for you, right? Mm -hmm. It's definitely not a need, and I live in a small enough community where we have actually a really good um, public transit system, a bus system. And everything is pretty accessible by a bike. I mean, we live in a small valley. So in nicer weather, anybody could get virtually anywhere they needed to go on a bike. Um, or you can walk, or there's a bus. Mm -hmm. or, but most people really do have cars. Okay. I, I'm just looking at that big CD rack behind you. <laughs> and I'm oh. thinking, 
I'm thinking because Doug was talking about Spotify, right? I know that as well. You could, you could, it would take you less than what two hours to save all those CDs to your Apple iTunes and run it <laughs> on your on your iPhone potentially. I just it, it it's just this idea. This is the idea of a collaborative economy, and it's not necessarily that stuff. But I mean, you could take all those CDs that you haven't listened to in I don't know how long and actually swap it. There's a place called swaptree.com and give it away to, to people who may want that stuff, who are mm -hmm. collectors, right? If I can interrupt, it, it, what is the difference between something like that and just donating your stuff to a consignment store, well, or even more so, a, a like a Salvation Army or Goodwill, where you just say, okay, I don't need this stuff anymore. I'm going to give it to a place where people can pick it up for 50 cents. Mm -hmm. That's like serial ownership, right? Like serial monogamy, right? So there's, like, because that, because with streaming and this kind of stuff, we're talking about you're not even really owning it while you're experiencing it. That's right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's an interesting, because the music business, as we know, is, has been in trouble, and it, and it's, but it's created opportunity for people the small musicians, maybe not to make a living at it, but to get their stuff mm -hmm. out there. And then you've got, like, now they're monetizing mainly, other than, like, the top, you know, Justin Bieber's doing great, I guess, or at least was. Um, but all now this is why we have $300 concert tickets and stuff. And, and so it's like the live experience becomes the way you monetize it. But that entire industry had to shift because of streaming, share, you know, collaborative, mm -hmm. shared stuff. Yeah. No, exactly. A lot of the artists are trying to control, I guess, how they make money because obviously the, the music industry itself is dying. So um, from what I hear, even uh, Lady Gaga, she can uh, monetize her own stuff easily just by like putting it on her own website. Because She's we, getting in Tony Bennett's well. She's all set. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. Um, Mila, what do you think about this? Well... I have a few, few different views, I guess, on on everything we've covered. Um, I think something that we haven't really talked about is the motivation mm -hmm. that people have behind participating in these different programs. Um, you know, when you talk about, you know, when you look at what a person is doing when they, you know, when they put something online and they exchange it or they sell it or they offer their services. I think that there's a certain psychological factor involved where it's it becomes rewarding to be able to see your things either in demand for different reasons. I mean, it could be you could either get really excited because someone actually bought something that you were going to, you know, throw away or you mm -hmm. might like the money. You know, money motivates a lot of people. But I think it's also a feeling of being helpful and and um I th I'm not sure if it was you Jason or Doug maybe who said what's the difference? between uh, just giving it to Goodwill and like then there's like a store there set up to to kind of manage this for you well I think you don't get this you get it's not the same kind of thrill or satisfaction to actually have that one-to-one -one, um, interaction whether you know who the real person is if they're using a mm -hmm. fake screen name or not there's a certain satisfaction I think in helping someone and seeing that they're grateful or seeing that they're happy with the product I mean, I, I used eBay way back, gosh, I don't know, maybe, I really don't know when it was. It seems like a lifetime. We'll call it maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And I remember when I used to sell uh, different things, I really enjoyed hearing that whoever bought it was happy with what they got. I mean, that was my, more so than the money. So if I sold something for 50 bucks, yeah, it's great to get the cash. But what I'd wait for was to hear like, hey, how did it, you know, did you like it? Did you get it okay? Was my packaging all right? It was just really interesting to have that experience and to connect with people that I would have otherwise not known. Now, I didn't maintain mm. relationships with them the way I do now in social media. Um, I recently had an experience. We just bought a new house, and we had to move two apartments into one house. So we had, like, a lot of double stuff. I'd never used Craigslist. I mean, I'd heard about it. Obviously, I know what it is, but I never really had a need to be listing stuff on Craigslist. But when I had like two fridges and two stoves and all this stuff, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out Craigslist. And another service that's equivalent, but Craigslist actually ended up 
being the only one with real results, which was quite interesting. I'm getting a bit distracted there. But um, what happened was when people came, like, it was really nice to know, like, okay, you know, this person looks like they're really going to appreciate this, you know, and I felt good about that. So I didn't really, in the end, care. At first, I was like, okay, I want to get, like, 500 bucks for this and 300 bucks for this. At the end of the day, I was kind of just happy to see someone take it, and, you know, I ended up, like, cutting my price because I was like, you know what, I'd rather see someone happy with this. Mm. Um, the other thing that was interesting was I had one guy come, and at one point after I'd sold all my big stuff, I, I looked at my garage, and I'm like, what else can I sell? <laughs> <laughs> and so I saw these tires that I'd had in my garage in my old place for like, I didn't even know, they must have fit my old car, but I don't even know if they were good. So I went on Craigslist, I looked for people looking for tires, found some guy, came over right away, and he's like, I'll give you 15 bucks. And I'm thinking like, these tires were like 200 bucks each. I didn't care. I was like, yeah, fine, whatever, give me your 15 bucks. You know, he was happy, I was happy. I said, what are you going to do with them though? He said he's going to melt them down and he's going to use it for brick pointing. And I thought that was so smart. So I think that it almost can create a wave, you know, as you as you contribute in one way, that can pick up and get, go somewhere else. And you don't really know where this wave of things is going to go. But I think people who are living in this environment and part of this collaborative behavior are, are likely to continue that and, and to do that in different areas. So I think... There's a whole psychological factor as well, aside from, you know, there's obviously economic gain. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I know I'm going on, but I have to mention this. Um, Stevie and I actually met playing an online game on Facebook. And playing this online game taught me so much about, this was back in 1998, I think. I don't know, Stevie. It's been about eight <laughs> or nine years. It, 2008. Sorry, 2008, 2007, 2008. But the reason I bring it up is because when I was playing that game, I saw so many people helping each other. Um, it was a dragon game, but you can compare it to like, you know, uh, Farmville and all these crazy games that people spend hours and hours doing. To me, that's an example of that mm. coll collaborative model. All these strangers are getting together, and I, to me, when I look at that, I think that's the birth of this economy spreading because people got used to the idea of you needed a stranger to help you out and you would help them. So I mean Stevie and I met through this kind of game and um, I learned so much from the people that I met and what we could accomplish so I think it's worth again back to the psychology of it I think it's worth mentioning that so mm. okay. That, cool. Well that's, what, that's one of the, the pillars of it right Milani? They say this whole thing about creating this trust economy through technology, because have you and Stevie actually met in real life? No, no, and you've known each other for for that many years. So Eight, nine I mean, years, yeah. Time to go to Jackson Hole. <laughs> I know, I'd love to. There's great fishing in Jackson Hole. I've been there a few times. Um, so here's a, a question, perhaps to explore. Then, um, what is it then about this moment? You know, we've we've seen this this really kind of um, rapid growth of these types of services that have emerged over the, the, the past couple of years. I mean, certainly we can look back at eBay and we can look back at the, at the, the, the start of Craigslist and saying that there are, there are good examples of this collaborative consumption in practice. But then we have this rise of all of these new services. Really, it seems within the past, say, two or three years, you know, is there something to be said about this specific moment that has led for these things to, to really kind of emerge? Like, what is it that we're seeing them growing now at such a rate um, in a way that they hadn't in the past? Mm, maybe it's partly comfort with the technology that we have now to a degree, and then also Gen, a lot of Gen Y people say they want to be entrepreneurs. That's got to figure into it some. Plus, the economy has sucked, so people have gotten, maybe people have gotten more creative. Mm. I don't know if entre has entrepreneurship gone up amongst Gen X, I wonder. I well, entrepreneur went up in, uh, entrepreneurship went up in like 2001, and we had a tech tumble there. Mm. All of a sudden a lot of people, who there were no jobs for them and they started their own companies and I think 2009 started, at least in part, started a similar surge. Now there may be just that Gen Y is more entrepreneurial but there are those examples about 
And I think I talked over somebody, so I'm going to mute now and let that person talk. No, no, you you talked over me, but I talked way too much. So that's <laughs> oh, I can talk over you. Forget that. Okay. <laughs> no, but everything that you said is right. I mean, the the whole wave of 2008 caused uh, you know people to lose their jobs, people to actually try to figure out other ways to actually uh, supplement their income. Um, the whole thing with um, Gen Y right now is that they're realizing that they have to live from job to job, and that they'll never get the kind of um, I guess stability that even that that maybe we had when we were younger. I, mm -hmm. No longer are we are we in jobs that are like 10, 15, 20 years. Like we're start they're starting to see a breakdown, and so um, they have to rely on whatever skills they have to see whether or not they can monetize that from a freelance standpoint. And um, I mean, and so it, that that extends to their stuff too, right? Potentially. Mm. Yeah, they don't have as much money, and I mean, if I was Gen Y, I would be thinking, okay, my real advantage here is I can use this technology, you know, and, and I have neuroplasticity still, so, you know, like, you know, the old people can't understand how to use Microsoft Word, so I, they need my help, you know. Um, and people are willing to pay for that. That's the fun, that, that's a great thing. Even, but if you think about it, um, what is that thing called? It's, it's, uh, Massive online, um, it's M O O C, the the whole the whole idea of, of so like Warcraft, exactly, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. But even schooling, like I mean, it's it's disrupting the the kinds of things that people can actually learn because you can you can get stuff on big data and and not have to necessarily pay for it. You get you get access to amazing professors without having to go to Harvard. Um, We've seen that. I mean, that's that's what's disrupting everything. Everybody has access to stuff they don't have to pay for, like they used to. And I think that's in itself affecting the whole I, this idea of capitalism. Don't you think? Like who as going? As long as the access to professors isn't on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, anyway, um, um, Stevie. Yeah. Well, I think an interesting um, an interesting example would be Pandora. You know, it started out as the genome um, the genome project, and it was free. Mm -hmm. So many people got involved in into Pandora, and then once it evolved out of genome project and became uh, a paid service, it kind of it's almost an ingenious model to use because you've already got everybody sort of addicted, if you will, or or on board, and then you sweep everybody into this membership, and so I think that they had already basically established like their major client base and just swept everybody into a monthly subscription because, mm -hmm. and this is pre pre Spotify as well, so it was kind of the only the only musical source of its kind that I at least knew of, and so. Um, Oh, I forget where I'm going with this, but yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good example of of how it can how it can mm. change and go from a mass consumption into a capitalist venture. Hopefully, that makes so sense. So, are we really saying then that that the rise of um, like these are these models kind of emerge as disruptors, or is it really kind of stepping back as being like satisfying a human need? You know, I mean, I kind of think of saying if it, if a service like this emerges, like if I live in an urban center, and I realize, okay, I don't need a car, and um, so I can use a bike share, um, and I can, if I ever need a car, I can get the short-term access to that, and that if I'm traveling, then I can use Airbnb. Is it more that starting in that place? And looking around and saying, okay, here are the economic conditions that I have to deal with, and so I don't need any of this stuff. Or is it more, it's like, I've got too much crap, and I just want to pull back. And so I sell off a bunch of stuff, and I go, and like, I kind of take more of a minimal approach. 
I, I, I think there's a few different things here, and one of them is that, you know, everything old is new again, and stuff like Airbnb, I mean, we booked a trip to Europe a few years ago. We didn't use Airbnb, but we rented an apartment through a more traditional service that may mm -hmm. or may not have been someone's, uh, where someone lived and just rented it out for part of the year, and if you think about people who had ski houses or whatever, you know, I live in New England, so... Um, a lot, there's a lot of that, and there are services where you rent out your house for when you're not mm -hmm. using it. Um, it's a bit more of a filling in the cracks. You know, Air Airbnb is a bit more peer-to-peer -peer in that way, but it's really providing a service that it's not. It's it's um, I guess remodeling a service that that's existed for generations mm -hmm. in some ways. So there's in some ways there's I won't say there's nothing new, but there's a lot of stuff that's based on old models but updated to the newer you know to mm -hmm. to the newer needs and the and the newer um, way of doing things you know I would say especially with Airbnb if you guys I don't know if you know how it started but it was two guys that needed to let's say go somewhere but couldn't couldn't afford a hotel room right and and, and plus um, they were saying that uh, you know they had to make rent on, on their on their place and um, they're trying to figure out a way to see whether or not if people were coming into the city would they be willing to stay at their place you know and uh, get to know get to meet people in the process and pay um, let's say 50 percent what they normally pay for a hotel mm -hmm. room and and stay with them and he said next next thing you know I think they tried it and they had five, 12 people staying at their house now I, I wouldn't think that that was kind of ideal, like twelve strangers uh, willing to stay at one place, at, but paying a lot less than they would at, at a hotel. Mm -hmm. But that was the start of it, right? I, I mean, there is this whole thing about the economy changing the way people spend money, and if they can do it in ways that doesn't necessarily have to necessarily ch sorry change the way um, they live, but but you know, make them a little bit more pragmatic about things. That could be it as well. Mm. I don't know. I think cost can certainly be a, like a, a, a motivating factor. Um, but I think more, it's it 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 seems to me it's more about that experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I would I would much rather if I'm if I'm traveling um, for business, and if I'm going to say you know if I'm work uh, I'm doing a, a writing project. I would much rather get an Airbnb than be pushed into a hotel with you know a crappy continental breakfast and you know lousy Wi-Fi and then, you know and for a significantly less cost I could go to and and be in someone's house or an apartment or or flat or um, I was actually I just had a conversation about this with with somebody earlier today that you know if there's there's now um, Airbnb um, has some great kind of Almost camping opportunities, you know. It's like if I'm going for a vacation home, I'm not just staying in somebody's house. Maybe I'm staying in like they have this rehabbed, you know, 1950s um, Airstream um, RV, you know, like the 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 the, the campers or a, a yurt. You know, those are kind of unique experiences that I can't get if I'm just going to a hotel or if I'm getting from a, a typical like vacation rental. Um, I think that I think there are a lot of factors there. There's there's convenience, like you. There's there's cost. There's convenience, and like you're saying too, there. That's a just a competitive product, right? Because like you mm -hmm. could rent a condo too, and that doesn't require much technology for the condo company. They may use computers and stuff like that to to enable it. But then, so I think the technology has created a lot of different options for us, and then they become just competitive products in that environment. So there, I think there are sort of like traditional and very new technological types of, of mm -hmm. companies like this. Hey Jason, have you stopped on, uh, uh, sorry, have you um, um, thought about the whole thing about sharing from a land perspective or job sharing, like the, uh, all that kind of plays into this whole idea of the, the collaborative economy as well. And you're, you know when uh, Doug was on a couple of weeks ago and talking about, you know, community growers, where mm -hmm. everybody kind of kind of shares um, in the land, and like they they grow for the benefit of the community. I mean that this is that's part of it as well, don't you think? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I'm um, I as I've said on on previous um, think tanks, um, I'm I'm part of a co-working space, 
And so, you know, what what originally attracted me and continues to, you know, uh, drive my membership and being in a co-working space, it was less about the um, the shared resources. It was less about just having class, you know, business class internet and 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 shared office space, you know, that that I didn't necessarily need to hang a shingle on my own or work from home. Um, but it was about being in the same physical space with other. Um, under independent consultants, whether they are consultants or designers or photographers or other creative professionals, you know, simply being in the same physical space, that was the that was what really drew me to them. And so there is a big effort in the most successful um, co-working spaces that the the amenities of the physical space are secondary to the community that is gathered inside those four walls. And yeah. so they take they take on their own um, it takes on its own character, and so there is a lot of of community support um, in sh pooling resources, um, you know, to to lift up the community, to lift up, you know, just to make other opportunities. You say we're going to start this here and and collaborate and share everything we are as an example of what it means for larger cities or for larger neighborhoods to say if it can work here then it can scale. No, that's and and that's important here because re remember we talked about the the peer to peer trust and it's it's like what what you're doing it's it's like you're you you're now just relying on the community to make things happen and you're not asking for permission, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the idea that we're talking about. Um, oh, sure. Um, no, I did, Stevie, I just I, I was just reading that uh, thing that you put in the chat about vertical harvest. That's very much similar to to what Jason was talking about, uh, locally grown food for the community in the in the vertical space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah it's a difficult. it's a great nonprofit, and uh, sadly, I don't know a huge amount about it, but uh, we are very land challenged here. Ninety seven percent of our land is protected so we have you know a massive housing crisis and um, land usage is you know very coveted so and we have a, a, a terrible growing season obviously being in the mountains so we have like a two-week window of growing and we're but we're big into local we're big into local produce and um, community-based products and things like that so somebody put together this program called vertical harvest and they are building upward instead of outward and it's going to be a giant greenhouse essentially mm -hmm. so that they can grow food year round and to my knowledge they're going to be um, providing food like to, to the restaurants and, and things like that so we have local produce year round grown organically in Jackson. That's cool and yeah. is it, uh, is, it um, is it defined by the community? Are, are are there people that that are feeding into it, or is it is it just is it an organization locally that's? It's an, I believe it's a nonprofit, but I know that it has a lot of local support, and it's gotten a lot of financial local support as well as um, a huge volunteer base. Okay, okay. Can we talk about so, uh, Jason? Um, you talked about co-sharing. Now, mm -hmm. Mila, you worked in a you, Mila worked in an environment where. Um, like you go to the office and there it, it's is there a co-sharing option where you are um, you know where people can work from home people and or they can choose that they have an mm -hmm. office space or or not um, where I am um, it's I wouldn't say there's any option for co-sharing we are testing out having um, people working from home Mm -hmm. It depends on your position, of course, because we, we're a financial services firm. We do insurance in um, different divisions. And so, for example, my team does personal insurance. So most of them are working. Um, it's not quite a call center environment because they're brokers, um, but they are expected to be on the phones, and they collaborate a lot. So um, it, it's become a challenge to see how we could have that kind of collaboration with the group that we have um, and and offer the sharing. Some people actually like to go to work for to have that collaboration, 
um, kind of like what Jason's saying, when he goes into a co-sharing environment, he's surrounded by other professionals and it's kind of nice to have that around you even though you're not necessarily working with those people. In our case, we're, they're all employees. We have a couple of people who do work from home um, and we have all the technology in place. We're paper free. We have, a, you know, um, VoIP. Like we've got everything set up that we could work from home, but we haven't gone to that level. Um, on a personal note, do I think it's possible? Absolutely, and I think there would there would be probably a lot of opportunity to invite other people from our area to use our office space if they needed it. And mm -hmm. something that I think in the past what we have done is we have offered some of our office space if someone wanted to have um, a meeting or something and they needed a boardroom and they were somehow connected to one of the directors or someone who would know about like to offer it we were open to doing that sort of thing and that was kind of interesting we haven't done it recently um, but I mean you know we're not doing it as much as we could be and I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity to be doing it um, on a side note though I'll, I'll mention I had mentioned this to you I think Hesse about Breather which is a really interesting initiative um, oh, yeah. It was born here in Montreal, Julian. yeah, with um, Julian Smith, and I I was on the beta of that, and I when I was taking a look at it, I thought it was just the coolest thing because it's the same idea as the you know the Airbnb for vacations, but it's just for moments that you might need to do office work or whatever. It's more of a private space, so you you know you sign up and you say, well, I need an office for you know three hours. Can I book it? And you book it and you go. And I think that's fascinating, and that's something a little bit different that's happening. I think that's a big, you know, I'm not sure who, it mm -hmm. must be individual owners of all these properties because he's spreading out now, um, you know, in Canada and the U.S. I think he's going worldwide, but um, those kind of opportunities also exist that more and more as biz traditional businesses are going to have to start looking at possibilities like that because you don't necessarily always need to have all your people in one box sitting there day after day. You know, it's interesting to share spaces and, and have those different experiences. I think it adds to our, our experiences as people. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on to, to comment here? Why don't we get to... what? How many questions do we have left, Jason? Uh, I've got a couple left. Okay. So... Where I think there's been there's a lot of the the attention that has been paid, and I think all of the examples that we have brought out tend to be um, very tech heavy services um, in in densely populated areas. You know, like that it seems to hinge on that. Is there perhaps um, a place or an opportunity for kind of these these models to emerge, um, maybe in underdeveloped markets? You know, I think of um, less from a, cl uh, a, a, a collaborative consumption perspective, but the, a lot of the work that has been done um, in building um, really highly functioning telecommunications networks tend to start in third world countries um, because they're just, a, 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 I think, for example, like the, the telecommunications network that is built in Afghanistan. Um, because it's just not physically possible to run landlines, so everybody is mobile, and so there is an like there is an opportunity like that they're focusing on very tech heavy, but not in areas where you would expect it. So I wonder if perhaps there's there's um, some markets that for these kind of sharing or collaborate collaboration services or products that could capture this collaborative consumption model and, you know, satisfy a real human need. Um, I think there's, like, opportunities with mobile banking. Yeah. That was one of the first ones I was thinking about because in in a lot of places, especially developing countries, if you think about what is it, uh, uh, less than 50% of the world's population mm -hmm. actually um, are below the poverty line. There are, half those people don't have access to banks. And so it, when we talk about, um, let's say, paying for things, uh, um, giving money from one person to another, everything can be done through text messaging right now. And Paysa does that. Everything is, is literally now a pin-encoded transaction between, between two people. 
um, and that's awesome without needing the this whole idea of the bricks and mortars bank and mm -hmm. uh, I love it the m -Pesa is in Kenya now it's going to mm -hmm. Afghanistan and there are mm -hmm. people that all you really need is a passport or some kind of national ID to actually get access to, to having currency on your phone. So, hmm. I love that. Do you guys think PayPal qualifies if you're sending money from one person to another? I guess it depends on what kind of network PayPal works on. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about text-based transactions, um, is one thing. If you're talking about being able to do it through an app, and I know that in some economies, Computing is all mobile in some countries. You know, one of the reasons I think the U.S. is behind, sometimes or quoted as being behind on mobile, is because we have had the desktop computers and the power behind that, and we were probably slower to adopt mobile because we didn't need it as badly or didn't rely on it as primarily. Um, so to answer the question about about PayPal, uh, I guess it depends on if if um, an app-based mobile um, infrastructure works in a certain mm -hmm. country or a certain economy. I guess I meant, I didn't mean is it a mobile banking platform, I meant is it yeah. is it a platform that that empowers the collaborative economy? It powers my NCAA bracket. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, well, it depends who uses it too, whether or not, like is PayPal a North American thing? Um, because in a lot of ways, Could too, be. it integrates with the existing, let's say, uh, payment systems, and there there has to be, like, everything is about encryption and security. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mila, you know all about that stuff. And it, when, when you talk about, like, the mobile payments in an emerging market, nobody cares that it has 18-bit encryption and that you need blah, blah, blah in order to authenticate, you know, X, Y, Z. Nobody thinks about that. They just want to be able to, to, to pay to, to pass and pass money from one person to another and to be able to store information, store money. Hmm. So. I know one service that I've used a lot is Venmo. Um, and it's you know it's it's built it's just it's a mobile to mobile like I send money. Um, which is great. You know, a couple of buddies are out at the bar and somebody picks up the tab and Ryan says, Oh I'll get you cash next week it's okay here it is and it's and it's an instant transfer it's like it, it immediately eliminates all of those problems which is awesome um, I think Square uh, Square has a, a, a similar service now with their Square Cash where you just it's effectively like emailing people money and now Facebook is doing it um, I just saw that announcement what I think yeah. last week um, that they're they're building in some of those mobile banking or you know just sending money via messenger which, Opens up all kinds of problems, right? How come we didn't we didn't talk about Kiva in this discussion? Is is that count or no? Um, so like microfinance. Yeah. Well, I think some of the earlier conversation was probably pointing to that in that direction when you're looking in other countries where that microfinance is enough to set up a business in a in a a, a small business in a in a place mm -hmm. remote you know i mean we're we're sitting here in uh, in north america where maybe that's not as relevant to us personally but if we're donating mm -hmm. to it, it and that um, was a pretty it was pretty big deal where kiva only um at first was only available to fund projects outside of the states mm -hmm. and that it doesn't have to be in, right yeah, now I think what it was in within the past, I believe maybe within the past year, they've made it available for domestic projects. But it would only at first, you know, be able to send, you know, I need a hundred bucks to get this thing started, and then there's a repayment schedule based on that. And and one of the things that Kiva can really boast is that they have a very very high repayment rate. Um, so now, you know, even even at a twenty five dollar loan, nobody's defaulting on them. Mm -hmm. I think it was just in terms of like the community aspect. There was there was one thing I, I threw up in the chat. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but Solocho or Soloco S O L O C H O, which is a site that was started by someone in my community. I live in uh, Newton, Mass, right near uh, Boston, and uh, one of our local uh, parent, probably about my age, uh, this guy I know actually started this, and this was more about. Um, it can be used for more than that, but a lot of it was this winter with all the snow. It was a lot of kids posting on there, uh, advertising their snow shoveling services. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are people who couldn't shovel their walks but really needed to, at least in terms of, you know, uh, the, the public good. Your sidewalk should be clear. 
but some people couldn't do it. And if they knew about the site and it was new, so it wasn't really mature yet. But mm -hmm. there were kids, uh, particularly high school kids, that were logging onto it and saying, we can shovel your walks and connecting through this website. Again, technology, but it's more just, it's less about technology, more just about a communications um, mm -hmm. uh, network for people to, to get the local teenagers to shovel their walk. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how big it became because it just started, but, but there was definitely some use of that and, and some discussion about it within some of our, our local community groups that we have here. That it's almost similar to what TaskRabbit was trying to do, mm -hmm. I yeah. guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along those lines, just just uh, at least initially locally based, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a great idea. Um, Jason, did you have any uh, cl closing remarks or a final a, a final question, perhaps? Yeah. Um, I think we actually. I mean, it, I've I've gone through my list, but I think what's um, what's interesting is that I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity for us to perhaps pick up this, this discussion again, um, because there was so much initial disagreement on kind of what this collaborative consumption model really was. I think there's some opportunities to kind of suss it out further, um, because I approach it from a you know the Ubers and the Lyfts and mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and and not thinking about it in a in a more pragmatic way of it's just you know collecting uh, connecting sellers and buyers and and uh, in that community um, in the way that eBay did. Yeah. No. Exactly. Um, is there anybody that has any closing remarks on this because it really it was an interesting discussion. And yeah, it certainly was. Yeah. So. No. Okay. On that note, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I don't know what our next topic is going to be, so I'm going to have to figure it out. I'll talk to Mila afterwards, and we can brainstorm. <laughs> um, but I want to—I want it to be a women's only one. I think there's something to, you know, there's empowerment and talking to women only for for once in a while, anyway. Um, I have a lot of proof that I'm actually a middle-aged woman. Like I, <laughs> I like hot baths, and I drive a Miata, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, like, I like Fabio. <laughs> um, yeah. Driving a Miata <laughs> Leave that alone, Doug. <laughs> I loved a Miata at one point. I know it's a stereotype, but I actually wanted the Miata when I was like 30 years old. And now it's like, did they even make it? I don't know. Anyway. I still see him. And I try, if I see a middle aged guy driving a Miata, I try to pull him over. Does he? Beat him up. Yeah, Just pull him over, beat him up. We're going to talk. It's a good car, but. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, guys. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks, and we'll we'll let you know what the topic it is is going awesome. to be at that time. Okay. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.